Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back live in Singapore. We hope you've got a coffee in hand or whatever it is to wake you up in the morning. Mm -hmm. I think some of our clients and network will be joining us from Middle East. Uh, a very good morning to you. And for those coming in from Asia and in Australia, afternoon almost, I uh, hope you're enjoying a fantastic event. A reminder, please, to visit the virtual exhibition if you can, to jump into the lounge and enjoy some great discussions. Um, I'm joined here by Michael Binger, who's Vice President of Southeast Asia at Under Armour. Under Armour need, of course, no introduction. One of the world's foremost apparel and sporting companies. They've got incredible partnerships, incredible businesses, both online, offline. They're huge supporters of a number of activities across sports, fitness and wellness and of course now health michael as well so yep. michael welcome thank you very much for joining us um you have a range of consumers a range of yep. customers uh, joining you in your shops joining you online uh, the last 12 months have been a roller coaster ride for everybody what trends are you seeing michael and in, in, in your customers in online shopping and retail shopping what behaviors what trends are you yeah. seeing from them well there there are a couple of trends that basically have been really just accelerated. And then there have been really new trends. I mean, one of them is obviously the enormous growth of e-commerce or anything that's digital. Yeah. Um, and that has just been accelerated from, from the year before. Uh, you do have still the rise of athleisure. Yeah. It's athleisure is here to stay as long as we work from home, <laughs> largely. Um, and then thereafter, we will have to see. Athlete, uh, athleisure and sports performance uh, is still a little bit different, um, but I mean, they kind of go hand in hand, but sports performance is a little bit more stable in terms of a segment. Um, sustainability, anything around sustainability, consumers' mindset have really changed in terms of sustainability um, and the the awareness of this challenging really practices of all, all companies, not only physical product companies, but also services. Um, and obviously a shift in exercise routines. Yeah. Now you've been in Asia marketplace for I think a couple of decades now. I mean, you've been here, yeah. you've seen it evolve, Michael, um, not just the home marketplace in Singapore, but of course the market across Asia how are you seeing the marketplace grow and, and, and where do you see it moving towards in terms of sportswear and athleisure? I mean, athleisure was mm. a very small segment only a few years ago and now it seems to be in a mind of its own. How do you view that market now and where it's going to go in the future? I mean, the sportswear market depends a little bit on the country. Singapore, uh, Australia are very developed. Uh, so is Hong Kong. Um, the other countries are really coming up and it's not only a matter of the, the metro or the capital cities, but it's more and more the second tier cities as well. Mm -hmm. So you do have that. It, it typically starts from uh, physical activities such as running and then moves into gyms and, and the various uh, more specialized uh, exercise regi regimes. Um, it's about the awareness of people. Um, it's about uh, being more health conscious and you don't have to be a super athlete. It's really, it's easier for people to get into sports now. Um, and obviously that leads the entire industry. It is still a little bit challenging for, for a lot of the major brands uh, when you talk about countries such as Indonesia, uh, even Thailand, that Tier two cities may not yet give you that critical mass, sure. um, but that's where we have online now. <laughs> that's where I have multi-branded uh, sports retailers as partners. Um, so we do penetrate into into those cities as well. Now you've been doing online e-commerce for a number of years. Um, we have saw this huge rush for consumers now to adopt um, that buying behavior. Yeah, looking beyond. COVID, with COVID in the rear view mirror, um, looking at how business will be done, do you think that e-commerce will be the dominant player as opposed to um, bricks and mortar retail? How do you see that balance kind of um, settling out? E-commerce will definitely be 
more important than it was pre-COVID, but yeah. it will not be the dominant player. Um, I mean, it depends a little bit, obviously, on, on the brand and, and the company, what, what share of business your online uh, channel has versus bricks and mortar. But um, in, in general, bricks and mortar will still be the dominant one. Having said that, both really have their, their place. Is brick and mortar will, to a certain extent, be more specialized, more service oriented. Mm -hmm. A lot of people talk about it's supposed to be the showcase of the, your brand. That may be the case for selected stores, especially in locations such as Orchard Road. Uh, but that's not the case for the bulk of your retail network. And I think we shouldn't underestimate in the future the, the role of that more suburban or community store, mm -hmm. because it's really about people may not be willing for quite a while to go to central business districts or the main shopping belts. Um, so that community store is really a quick and easy, convenient uh, touch point uh, of the consumer. Now, brick and mortar uh, online is about convenience. It's about convenience, it's about uh, information. Um, and that will have its place. The online channel also tends to be much more promotion driven than the brick and mortar one. Um, so you have to play both in, in tandem. Mm -hmm. And um, But neither one of them will dominate the other one. Now you have a number of bricks and mortar retail stores, Michael, and um, I think one of the, the key messages from this morning is it's their future is bright. But of course, you, you might have to now re-envision how what that store's purpose is. Is it there as a showcase store? Is it there for educational purposes? Is it there for product? How do you think the typical shop, retail shop, might look differently in the future from what it does today? It depends really, again, on, on location. Um, yeah. Again, a lot of people say, uh, the future store needs to, to have a lot of digital elements. Um, there is a lot out there in terms of technology that can be done. Um, there is a lot out there that is still gimmicks, <laughs> um, that is really not commercially viable to roll out in, in a large scale and, and may not really answer to what the consumer is really looking for. Um, so I would, again, separate it into you have your certain uh, flagship or tier one stores um, that have much more of an uh, omni-channel approach um, and, and servicing the consumer from, the, from that side. It has more information about the brand. It gives you more that immersion and, and that emotional connectivity. Um, and then you have your... your more commercial, probably smaller footprint stores, uh, at least for brands who need a, a bigger reach in terms of, of uh, store network. It boils down to, at the end of the day, to really customer service, having really trained staff yeah. uh, to give that, that service quality and service level. Um, it boils down to a loyalty CRM strategy um, and I think these are the, the two key, key elements to tackle first, rather than really talking about uh, super flashy stools. Uh, they may come about in certain locations, um, but it'll be more the, the exception rather than the norm of, of any retail network. Let's look at sales and marketing, mm. and we'll split the question maybe up into two halves. Um, the first being digital activations, and the mm. second being physical activations. And I suppose what this um, COVID disruption pandemic um, has seen is a rise in companies now spending on digital marketing, digital sales activations. Yes. Um, what are your thoughts on what makes successful act uh, activations? Do you think we're going to see more and more of them as people are consuming um, more and more content online. What are your thoughts around the future of digital activations and sales? 
I think uh, uh, even before COVID, the trend was towards uh, communicating to your customer base on online. Sure. Um, what has happened is that we just have an acceleration and we probably have more uh, more opportunities um, to, to hook into that uh, because there are simply more of our partners, whether it's gym networks, whether it's individual athletes producing content. Um, so that easy to consume content uh, online is, is, is definitely about to stay there and we can obviously loop into that. Um, there have been obviously uh, also a rise in the uh, virtual competitions, whether it's running uh, marathon competitions, whether it's training competitions. Um, they do represent an opportunity, but I think in the long term, once uh, physical is open again, uh, it will take maybe a little while, but ultimately people will roll back to physical events. Now, you've had so many physical activations. I know mm -hmm. one of your, the key ones in Singapore here was, was Test of Will, which was an incredible, and actually not just in Singapore, for those that haven't mm -hmm. done the Test of Will challenge, it was across most of Southeast Asia, I yeah. believe, and it really was um, a phenomenal. What are your thoughts on getting physical activations back up and running? The, People want them. Um, is it just a case of timing now? And when the, when the timing's right, you know, we can then start to look out for more and yeah. more physical activations? Uh, it's a matter of timing, yes. Um, obviously, all brands or, or even event um, organizers are really, I mean, the, the critical criteria is it has to be safe. Sure. Um, and once it's safe and once people feel comfortable to join physical events again and, and they will probably look a little bit different than before um, but then we will go back because it's at the end of the day we are social animals yeah. <laughs> it's um, you can have competition uh, online in a virtual environment but it's nowhere near the experience than having it on the ground uh, in, a, in a physical event um, so I it's a matter of time. Now, you've had such deep relationships with ambassadors, with athletes, with sporting stars, even with sporting amateurs. Um, mm -hmm. They've played such a pivotal role in Under Armour's development. Um, how do you see that manifesting in the future? Is, is there room for more athletes, more influencers? Are they mm -hmm. going to continue to play a role? And, and, um, and what are you looking for perhaps in Southeast Asia in, in terms of ambassadors and athletes yeah. to support? Yeah, I mean, especially during the pandem pandemic uh, influences and, and KOLs in, in general um, have been extremely important because yeah. in the absence of, of sporting events or, or any uh, physical activations, they've become a little bit the voice of the brand the, um, and from that point of view it, it's really important to have the right selection of, of brand ambassadors um, number one you want to have those that totally are aligned with your brand and your brand values uh, that have a story to tell uh, that know how to tell them because that's very often a challenge um, and who have the right reach, whether it's geographical or in terms of your target group. So we will continue to look out for uh, for the best brand ambassadors that represent our values, um, and that is very much sport performance uh, related for us. Um, it's difficult in Southeast Asia, and actually we are covering now more than Southeast Asia. We're covering from Hong Kong to down to New Zealand, Australia, all the way to to India. <laughs> it becomes very impossible actually to find one ambassador who can okay. communicate across all these cultures. Mm. Um, but within each uh, country or, or culture, we're definitely looking at, at the right ambassadors. And if you actually look at it at, from a global point of view, the global brand ambassadors are extremely important. Uh, I mean, for Under Armour, take alone somebody like The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, 
<laughs> he has over 230 million Instagram followers. This is even much more than Under Armour has. <laughs> so when he talks, uh, he has a reach that is enormous. Obviously, that's an exception, but you have a, quite a few of those where, th from a global perspective, that, that is very important and that really shines into, into our markets as well. Yeah. Well, you've always had a great community, Michael. I think that's, mm. you know, um, speaking about this just from being in Asia, I think the Under Armour community in terms of ambassadors, uh, events, um, outreach, engagement, how how have you built that in the first instance? How was that community built? And I suppose, how have you been able to foster and energize that community throughout the pandemic? That's not easy, of course, trying to build a community and then trying to maintain a community. What have you found that has worked? And perhaps what are some of the things that you're now doing to invest in that? Well, I mean, it... It started really very small um, in, in Southeast Asia and some of the other countries. So you really have to engage with the, with the right personalities. Um, and it's a journey together. It's yeah. for us to really build with them uh, what are the events, the executions uh, that, that are aligned with the Under Armour values. Um, whether it's from running groups to the test of will or, or other training activities. Um, and then it's about consistency, to really consistently uh, work with them. Uh, it's let them bring in their ideas as well. It's during the pandemic, it depended a little bit on con uh, from country to country. Singapore was yeah. probably more on the stricter side with really no physical activities. Uh, in Malaysia, it was a little bit more open, for example, so we, we could still do some, obviously with safe distance me measures, um, some activations or uh, the brand ambassadors had their own uh, activities um, still representing Under Armour. It's, um, and then you've, you feed in that virtual uh, element as well. So it's really, it's really being on your feet <laughs> at the end of the day. Um, but that's actually a good thing because it challenged a lot of of, uh, of ways of working um, that that all had in the industry. Yeah. Um, so I think it's it's now being much faster. How is your thoughts on community internally? Because of course. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you you work in a large international multi-brand, but you've got a team here in Singapore and across Asia, Michael. Mm. How how have you managed to cope through this pandemic in terms of communication, working from home remotely, uh, hot desking? I mean, what is your thoughts on, I suppose, the workplace of tomorrow and, and how you are engaging your team? It wasn't actually so much of an issue for us. Um, it's because number one, it's especially for the team in uh, Singapore, because having always had regional uh, responsibilities, um, we're used to communicating uh, in a not physical environment, yeah. meaning via Zoom, WebEx, whatever, uh, telephone. Yeah, it's um, so. Th that clearly helps. Uh, same for, for our uh, subsidiary or partner markets. Um, so we've always had that, that kind of uh, way of working before. Um, obviously within the team here, it's, I mean, number one, it's easy if you have the infrastructure in place. Um, so it wasn't an issue for us sending everybody home at short notice, just what happened here last week. Um, because people can plug in and, and work from home, have access uh, to the system. So I think that is, let's say, a hygiene factor that you have to fulfill. Otherwise, it becomes very difficult. Uh, after a while, obviously, um, people want to have a little bit more of that physical uh, interaction. Having said that, it still needs to be, it, we would not uh, ask everybody to come back to the office. Yeah. So we keep it to around 50% of, of the staff and still have certain uh, 
rosterings um, that we want to adhere to for, for quite a while, simply to, to make everybody feel safe and, uh, and to work within that new reality. Um, but at least the feedback that we've had from, from our team is that a lot of them prefer to have that rostering, um, to have those days in the office, um, rather than being 100% uh, work from home. Let's turn the spotlight on you, Michael, for mm. the last few minutes. Um, before the pandemic, you were traveling a lot. You were on yeah. a plane an awful lot. <laughs> um, no doubt you miss those days, but as, as COVID comes back out, do you see yourself traveling as much again? Is there an appetite personally for you to travel on a, on a plane to do business or are, are you more content to, to stay at Singapore more often? I will definitely be different. Uh, I will definitely do certain trips, especially because uh, during the uh, or just before the pandemic, pandemic with it, with that enlarged area, I haven't been to some markets um, <laughs> that have been folded into the uh, Singapore office. Um, so Australia will be one location um, that that I would want to visit. Uh, very soon, but I'm not so keen on the process of traveling <laughs> because I don't yeah. think it will be very uh, very convenient. I think those days where you can turn up at Changi 40 minutes before your flight departs are gone. Um, so not looking forward to that part. So from that point of view, I think traveling will be permanently reduced uh, and it really be much more purposeful. Yeah. Um, and then the closing question, Michael, I suppose we're asking everybody, mm. how, how have you kept up your own physical health, your, your mental health, your spiritual health? Um, how have you done it in the past? And then how perhaps has this pandemic changed how that you've looked on your own health? It hasn't changed. I mean, it does help when you don't travel that much. <laughs> yeah. So from that point of view, that, that has helped. Um, it's, I mean, obviously during the, the uh, pandemic, especially the, the actual beginning of it with the circuit breaker, is um, you turn to a healthier food. Yeah. Um, at least we do in terms of uh, cooking at home rather than ordering in. Yeah. Um, and but it's important i think to to uh, establish a certain routine because working from home can actually be more stressful than working in the office because the boundaries blur yeah. Yeah. um and especially if you're an in international organization uh time zones blur <laughs> <laughs> it's so it's important to have a little bit that routine and to to put aside uh whether it's in the morning i'm not a morning person so for me it's more in the the evening to have that one to two hours where you just jump on your bike or do mm -hmm. what you can do very cool yeah well look ladies and gentlemen i thoroughly enjoyed that conversation um i can't wait personally to get back and try test of will yeah again um uh, lots of fun and um if you want to catch uh, Michael and the, and the team, hopefully we'll see you soon at Physical Activations in Singapore. But Michael, thank you very much for a great conversation. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back in just a few minutes for the next one, but we'll see you very soon. Thank you.